This morning, I'm going to ask you guys a question, but you should know that when you're asked a question in church, especially during a sermon, I'll give you a little hint, the answer is usually Jesus. All right, just keep that in mind. So when you're in one of those equipped classes and someone asks you, just say Jesus, and usually that's the answer. So your instinct here to this question is going to be to say Jesus, but I want you to think about it. I want you to give it some thought, and here's the question. Who is the authority in your life? See? See? Who do you answer to? Who is in control of all the major decisions that you make? Now, I don't know about you, but I have several different authorities in my life. Like, when it comes to anything having to do with my car, my dad's the authority. Like, if he says, you got to fix this, you got to replace this, I just say, okay, done. I listen to him, right? Um, When it comes to financial decisions, I actually talk to Frank Aranio here in church because I'm pretty sure that guy has been wrong zero times in his life about anything. One of the smartest guys, and when I have to make a a financial move, I ask him if he says do it or don't do it, I listen to him. When it comes to all things pizza, my authority is Bobby, my friend here in church. I call him my pizza sensei. The guy just knows pizza, which is a passion in my life. And if he says go to this place, it's good. If Bobby says it, I don't even need to try it to know it's going to be good. I have an authority on how I spend my time and schedule things, and that is Danielle, my wife. So if someone says... You want to hang out Friday night? My answer is usually, well, I have to check with the boss first, right? When it comes to how, you're, how you live your life, who is your supreme authority? Now, if you're sitting there and you go, oh, it's Jesus, that's great. Well done. I'm going to have to put that to the test this morning because we're gonna get into some heavy, sensitive topics, and I'm gonna say some things that you might not wanna hear because we're gonna talk about sex, we're gonna talk about marriage and divorce and adultery, and you might hear something that Jesus says, and you go, oh, I don't like that. And listen, you don't have to like it, okay? Especially if you're new to the faith, you hear something, I don't really like that. That's one thing. But you might say, I don't like that, and I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna adhere to that. Now listen, you have the right to do that. I'm not here to tell you how you should live your life. I'm here to preach the gospel and tell you what the Bible says and what Jesus is saying, not to tell you how to live. But if you say, I don't like that and I'm not gonna adhere to it, that's fine, but you have to reevaluate your answer to the question of who is the authority in your life. And today, this message is a message devoted to anyone who's ever struggled with lust. And you might look around and say, oh, I'm so glad so-and-so is here because I know they're struggling or I know who I'm gonna send a link to after church. They need to hear it. But in reality, this is a message for all of us today. And before we get into it, and before we get some real topics going, we need to go to our authority in prayer right now. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're opening your word, and it is a sacred time, Lord, where you wanna speak truth into our lives. Lord, thank you so much for loving us enough to correct us and to teach us and to mold us, Lord. Let your will be done. And I pray you would help us to not leave here the same way that we walked in. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he's preaching to his disciples along with this large crowd that's gathered on what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And last week, we looked at Jesus, who's preaching on the sixth commandment, which says, you shall not murder. And now this week, he's talking about the seventh commandment, which says, you shall not commit adultery. So What happened here is he went from preaching about the sanctity of life to now preaching about the sanctity of relationships, and specifically marriage, because that's the first relationship that God has established. Now, let's look at what he says in verse 27. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, at this point, when Jesus is preaching to this crowd, there were probably some men in the crowd who started to squirm and maybe felt a little uncomfortable, and they're like, oh, look at the time, honey, we gotta go, we have that thing, you know, that thing, we gotta go, because it's awkward. And Jesus is once again raising the bar. It's not just the act of adultery, it's the heart of adultery. And in this passage, Jesus is making six comparison statements until the end of the chapter where he says, you have heard it said this, but I say that. And Jesus is saying, look, I know you've been taught this from the Pharisees and the scribes and the culture, but I need to set it straight today. He's establishing himself as a supreme authority. He's getting rid of any conjecture and any misinterpretation. 
And I think that's important even to today because sometimes we look to the culture to help us. We look to other people to get advice and, and feedback on how we should live. And what I'm telling you is that we need to be careful who we listen to, especially our culture, because our culture doesn't always get it right. I was reading on the Barna Research Group, they put this out, that teens and young adults both agree that not recycling is a greater immoral act than viewing pornography. I read that, I go, you gotta be kidding me. Our, our culture is lost. There is a lust and loneliness epidemic. And I had a conversation with a buddy of mine a while back, and he said, Andy, my marriage is struggling, and we're not connecting, and we're always fighting, and I don't even think she likes me anymore, and we don't laugh like we used to, and I don't know what to do. And he says, I talk to all of my friends, and they all say I should end it, and I think maybe they're right. And he looks at me and says, what should I do? And I said, why in the world are you asking me what I think? I said, what does it matter what I think? And who am I to give you my opinion? I said, I asked him the same question I asked you. I said, well, who's the authority in your life? Who do you, who do you answer to? Did you make a covenant in the sight of God and those witnesses to love each other without end in sickness and in health? Have you, have you tried to work on this? Have you considered counseling? See, that's why Jesus is saying, look, I know your friend said this, right? Or, or Oprah said that. And the culture says this other thing and saying, but I'm the Lord. And, and this is what I have to say. And not only that, this is how it's going to be. If you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. So if you're there listening to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and you haven't physically committed the act of adultery, it doesn't mean that you're innocent. It doesn't mean that you're off the hook. Now, let's look at this. Anyone who looks at a woman, this comes from the Greek word blepo, and it's important to look at these words because it's written in the present tense. So it means to continually look at. So it's not a passing glance. In fact, it's the moment where a glance becomes a gaze, where a look becomes lust. And you might be wondering, when is that moment when a look graduates to lust. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, King David is on the roof of his palace and he sees a babe. He sees this beautiful woman who is naked, who's taking a bath. Now, this might sound strange, but David was not in sin for the glance. He could have seen it, let out a few giggles, and then moved on with his day. But that glance turned into a gaze, and he sent someone out. Point, go find me that babe. Tell me who that person is. And he finds her. He violates her marriage, gets her husband killed, and there's all this destruction that, that followed, and he had to live with that fallout. And, and what Jesus is saying here is that the moment the adultery took place was when he saw her on the roof and didn't look away. And there's this old proverb that says, if you sow a thought, you reap an act. So an act, you reap a habit. So a habit, you reap a character. And if you sow a character, you reap a destiny. See, regardless of where it ends, sin always begins when there's this evil thought that's sown in your mind and in your heart. It's the moment when the glance turns into a gaze. Now, I don't want you to be confused and think that lust is just a man problem. All right, that's, that's simply not true. Perfect example would be in Genesis 39, where the Bible's talking about Joseph, and it says that Joseph was well-built and handsome. Why does it say, it's like it goes out of its way to say, and Joseph was fine. It just <laughs> lays it out, he's a good-looking man. And there's Potiphar's wife, who's noticing him around the house. Now, we could notice attraction. There's nothing sinful about noticing that someone is good-looking. We have a church filled with good-looking people. Perfect example is Joe Sanza right there. Ladies, he is single. That is a good-looking man. Now that is, sorry, Joe. Joe, Joe was like, again? <laughs> that glance turned into a gaze, and she became obsessed and cast longing eyes on him and lustfully said, hey, let's do this. Like, come to bed with me. Let's go. And Joseph literally ran away from that situation because he was in a position spiritually where he was ready to flee. And he, he didn't just run out of there. He streaked out of there, right? Because when he ran, she grabbed his robe, but he just kept running because it's better to lose your robe than to lose your integrity. And you might be wondering, 
well, Andy, where's the line? Like, how do I know when it's not just a look and it's becoming lust? You know. You, you don't need me to tell you. You just know. You know, the other day, my wife and I were taking a walk with Jackson in the mall, and I smelled something intoxicating. It was this warm blanket of cinnamon and sugar in the air. And I turn to my right, and I see it. Cinnabon. And they put these TVs in front of the store, like big TVs, and they have this slow motion, seductive shots of cinnamon rolls coming out of the oven and cutting into them and just eating them. And I felt myself floating like in the cartoons <laughs> towards the smell. And there was this moment <laughs> where a glance became a gaze. And I said, you are so beautiful. <laughs> And Danielle says, thank you. I was talking about the cinnamon. Don't tell her. I was. Now Jesus says, I just realized she's in the room. Uh, sorry. Now Jesus says something shocking that gets a big gasp from the crowd. Look at this. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And the same thing applies to your hand. Cut it off. Now, this gets really hairy for people who like to interpret the Bible literally. It's not like you see someone who's missing an eye in their right hand and go, oh, you're a Christian, right? <laughs> no. Jesus wants a reaction. He's saying we need to take sin seriously in our lives. And I want to make sure that I'm teaching this passage seriously and properly because I don't want anyone to come back next week with an eye patch saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. It is figurative. It is not literal. Jesus is not suggesting mutilation, but mortification, meaning put your sin to death by any means necessary. And in Judaism, your right eye represented your best vision. Your right hand represented your best skill. And Jesus is saying, you should be willing to give up anything that's leading you to sin, regardless of how precious it might be to you. Now, I'm going to give you three steps this morning to make it simple, to, to take Jesus' words and put it into action. And I made it three R words just so it's easier for you to memorize. The three R's are recognize resist and remove. This could be your mantra this week if you're really struggling. The first step is to recognize that there's sin in your life that you need to confront. Jesus says it like this, if there's anything that causes you to stumble. Now, the word stumble in the Greek, we get this word skandalizo, which is where we get the modern word for scandal. And I would define it like this. It's the cause of your fall. So think of it like this. Let's say Jesus, uh, sorry, let's say that Satan is constructing a giant trap, and he's hoping to get you. He's hoping to, to just, this is it. This is the thing that's going to get you to fall. The question would be, what is the bait that he would put in that trap that would get you to fall? Is it your phone? Is it your computer, a relationship? Is it money? Is it a bottle of something? See, whatever it is, you have to be on guard against it and be ready to get real drastic real quick. You have to recognize you are not above falling just because you're a Christian. If anything, you have a bigger target on your back. And the second step is to resist that sin. The question is, how aggressive are you going to be in your fight against it? Jesus says you have to be willing to cut it off and gouge it out, meaning this isn't fun and games. He is putting you to the test and he's asking you this question. What is your purity worth? Identify your trigger and remove it. So I want to give you some examples. Maybe you can relate. You know, maybe there's a show that you love and you're binging it right now. Maybe like Netflix, Hulu, or HBO, or whatever. And you're watching it and you love it. But you know you need to stop watching it because it's filled with all this sexual content and it's causing you to stumble and it's not good for you spiritually. Maybe there's an artist or a song that you love and you have it on repeat and you like crank it up at the gym or something and, and it's just on repeat but the lyrics are filthy and they ring around in your head and you know this is not good for you spiritually. You shouldn't be listening to this music anymore. Maybe it's your phone and you're on social media way too much. And you constantly have this thing in your right hand and you've become addicted to it. It's become like a part of your right hand and you need to cut it off. Maybe it's time to delete that app. 
maybe it's time to temporarily downgrade to a flip phone. And you might say, if I said that to my teens, there would be a gasp in the room. No, I'm not going to do that. Now, listen, you might struggle with your phone, and I'm saying, hey, temporarily downgrade to a flip phone, and you'll look at me like I'm crazy. But Jesus is saying, be aggressive, be drastic. So let's change that verse and bring it to 2023. If your iPhone causes you to stumble, downgrade to a flip phone. Now, it doesn't sound so bad when you compare it to gouging your eye out and cutting your hand off. Now, I don't know if anyone needs to hear this, but I'm just gonna say it. Maybe it's a relationship with someone who isn't your spouse. And you say, oh, but it's just like harmless flirting. It's really playful. I would never act on it. I'd never actually cheat on my husband or my wife. Listen, you're playing with fire. You need to cut that relationship off. You need to pull back. Regardless of what it is, Jesus is saying, get aggressive. He's saying that there should be nothing too precious in your life that you shouldn't be willing to sacrifice to maintain your purity and protect your spiritual health. And the last step, is to remove this sin. Jesus says, after you cut it off, you throw it away. You don't keep it as a souvenir. You remove yourself from that situation. You walk away from that person or that thing that's causing you to stumble. And you might be wondering, well, Andy, how do I know if this thing, like if I'm crossing the line with this person or or in this situation? Listen, what I'm telling you is, if you can see the line, you've come too far. You probably need to pull back and run away. Second Timothy, it says, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. The word is flee, not flirt. You know, this reminds me of a former youth group teen who was coming out to youth group. She's an outspoken atheist. And she said to me this, she's lovely, but she, she said this in front of the whole group. She said, being a Christian is so restrictive. I could drink alcohol, I can do drugs, I can do all that, you can't. I can have sex with whoever I want. You can't. She says, I watch porn anytime I want. You can't because you're a Christian and your God says that it's bad. And I was confused. I said, I don't think you understand. You might think, oh, I could watch all the porn I want. But in reality, you couldn't stop if you tried. Your freedom is an illusion. You're more enslaved than you could ever know. That's why in Ephesians, Paul says it. He says, you were once dead in your sins. They don't know. You don't know that you're dead in your sins until you come to life. You're walking around thinking you're alive and you're free. And I don't know about you, but now that I'm free from sin, I don't feel restricted. I'm free to follow God and pursue the real plans he has for me, not the youthful lust. Tell me again how I'm restricted because I'm following Jesus. It just makes no sense. But this is how our world thinks. This is our culture. Being in Christ, let's just sum this whole thing up. Being in Christ means you have the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a big statement. That's a big deal. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything you need to stand up and fight against the scandalizos or the traps. Now, whether you tap into that power, that's another question. It's up to you and your willingness to surrender. Jesus will give you all you need for it. Now Jesus is zooming in on marriage, and he's talking about divorce. Let's look at what he says. In verse 31, it has been said that anyone who divorces his wife should give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. Now, I know I say this a lot when I preach, and I'm just going to continue to say it until you have this burned into your mind. It's very important when we read scripture, especially scripture like this, that we don't just immediately take it and throw it to today and throw it to someone's current situation. You first have to look at the culture and what's going on and why is Jesus saying this? And then after you understand the context, then you apply it to today, okay? So here's what was happening. The Jews of Jesus's day believed that marriage was sacred. So a 20-year-old man who wasn't married was considered to be living in sin. Sorry, Joey, that would would be you, buddy. (laughs) Now, the men were basically, poor Joe, required to marry. They were required to marry and have a family. There was no word for bachelor back then, okay? Now, the Jews also had a very low view of women. I'll just explain it the way F.F. Bruce does, the Scottish Bible scholar. He says that the wife was bought, regarded as property, used as a household servant, and then dismissed at pleasure. 
And this low view of women meant that the men could do whatever they wanted in the marriage, and the women just had to go along with it. And so Jesus is addressing a law that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, that was being manipulated by the culture they were living in. It says this, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and then he fi- and she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, he writes her a certificate of divorce. This is what Jesus is addressing. And it's all centered around this word indecent or unclean. If she is found unclean, then under God, by law, you can divorce her. So at the time, there were two rabbis. One prominent rabbi, he was a conservative, his name was Shammai, he said that the only reason you can divorce under God and not be in sin is if the woman is caught in adultery or sexual immorality. That's what the passage means. But there was another guy, another rabbi, his name was Hillel, and he said that uncleanness does not just mean sexual immorality, it's anything that displeases you as a husband. And so there's a lot of reasons where it is acceptable under God for you to divorce your wife. I'll just name a few in the culture that was going on. For example, if the wife spoke disrespectfully about the husband's parents in front of him, he could divorce her. That's crazy. If she spoke argumentatively and it could be heard next door, divorce under God. If she cooked a bad dinner, that's one of them, divorce. If the man found someone else who was prettier and could please him better, that's grounds for divorce. So you have two rabbis, one who says, only divorce for sexual immorality and adultery. The other says, eh, anything that displeases you as a husband. Now, who do you think's more popular, right? Who do you think the people are listening to? The men love this idea, oh, I could just divorce her and God won't be mad at me? And so now that you understand the background and what was happening like crazy, look at how Jesus confronts it. I know you're being taught this. I know what Hillel is saying, but let me establish. Whoever divorces his wife, and he says, let me clear the air, for sexual immorality is forcing her to commit adultery. Jesus is saying, if you think that you can toss your wife to the side and divorce her, that is not okay. He says, I'm gonna define uncleanness. It is sexual immorality, not a bad dinner. Who do you think you are? Not because she spoke badly about your mom. She's got some problems, get over it. Not because you found someone prettier. Who do you think you are? He's saying, stop abandoning your marriage vows. Now, one of my greatest joys as a pastor is officiating weddings. I'm over 20 now, and I love it. I genuinely enjoy it. I love premarital counseling and getting to know the couple. I get a front row seat at the wedding to see this joy and beauty and free cake at the wedding. I love it. (laughs) And I always tell couples, when they meet with me, I say, you're gonna spend a lot of time and energy preparing for your big day, for your big wedding, and you're gonna pick out the venue and your dress and his tux and the cake and the centerpieces and the DJ and the photographer and the food and all your money is gone. And after all of that, you're gonna have your last dance and then everyone gets out of there. And you know what you're left with? Your marriage. So as you prepare for the big day, prepare for your marriage. And I tell the couples, I get, when we talk about vows, I get very serious. And I tell them, you have to think really hard about every word of your vows. I get very specific and I say, look, if you're funny, be funny. You know, you can be sappy and sentimental, that is great. But you have to remember, these are promises that you are making before God and your soon-to-be spouse, and you have to keep every single one of them under God. So be careful with every word that you write. Now, the reason I write that or say that is because our culture does not take vows seriously. I was at a a wedding just attending, and and the bride and groom said this in their vows. I promise to love you for as long as love lasts. And everyone went, aw. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? (laughs) I promise to love you for as long as love lasts. Like, I promise to love you until I don't, (laughs) and then I'm out. Like, what is that? If something's broken, you fix it, you don't bail on it. And that's why if you look at verses 33 all the way to 37, you see Jesus addressing oaths and vows that we make to each other. Your word alone does not carry that much weight. That's why when you're in court and they say, do you promise to tell the truth? What's your hand on? A Bible. 
That's why when we say things, when we say, I promise, that's not as big of a deal as if you say, I pinky promise. Because you're promising on your pinky. The most important, the biggest, most powerful promise is to say, I promise, and I cross my heart. I hope to die. I'll stick a needle in my eye. That's a promise. That's why I trust kids more than you adults. No adult has ever promised me something like that. Hope to die. Jesus is saying, look, if you make a vow and you bring God into that, you better keep your word. In fact, you can't keep God out of it, it says, because his presence fills the heavens and the earth. So not only did you make a vow to your husband or to your wife, you made a vow to God. He is a partner in your transaction. And if you say, I do, you better mean, I do. And in this passage, Jesus is talking about sexual immorality, and it comes from this Greek word, pornea. It might sound familiar because that's where we get our word for pornography. And the reason, see, it's, it's speaking about sexual sin in a broad context, meaning sexual activity that's outside of marriage. And there are many times in Scripture where this word pornea is mentioned, like Romans 1, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, and there's, there's tons of them. And the reason why the Bible talks so much about it is because the culture was drowning in it. Has anything changed? Our culture is drowning in it too. You have access to pornography as easily as just reaching into your pocket and pulling out your phone. We could see more naked bodies in five minutes than previous generations could in five lifetimes. This is the destructive power of technology. And a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that I used to do this series with the youth group, and they would ask me anonymous questions. I'd put a box out, and they could ask me anything, and nothing's off limits, and I'll answer it as best as I can. Nine out of 10 times when a teen asks me a question that's not a joke or a meme or something, it's a sex question. That's all they want to know about. That's all they ask me about is something related to sex. And one of the teens wrote this question in the box, and it said, why does the Bible talk so much about how sex is wrong? It's just physical. What's the big deal? And I read that and I go, my goodness, that is not just a teen thing. My generation says that, our culture says that, and I want to address that. And so what, what I said to them, and I say to you today, is that first of all, the Bible does not say that sex is wrong. I don't know why anyone thinks, the Bible says that sex is beautiful and it's created by God. And people think, oh, the Bible's so prude. It's not. There is a whole book of the Bible about sexual intimacy called Song of Solomon. I'm not going to do a book study on that anytime soon, just so you know. If you're thinking, oh, you're going to get into that and that, really. <laughs> Jewish boys were not allowed to read that book of the Bible until they turned 13 because it was so sexually explicit. Sex isn't wrong, but there are healthy laws and expectations around it. Frank Turek, who's my favorite apologist, he puts it like this. All sex is like fire. You put it in your fireplace, it's wonderful, it will warm you. You get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. Maybe not immediately, but over the long term, it will. And I want to explain it to you the same way I did to my teens. I said to my teens, I said, what does it mean if someone comes up to you and pats you on the back? And they say, oh, that means a good job or encouragement and support. I said, okay, what does it mean if your grandma comes up to you and gives you a kiss on the cheek? They said, oh, that's like, you know, care and affection. I said, what does it mean when your crush comes up to you and plants one right on your lips? They say, oh, that's romantic. And I said, what does a slap across the face mean? And they say, that's an insult, we're gonna throw hands. And I said, okay, if a pat on the back, a kiss on the cheek, a kiss on the lips, and a slap across the face all convey something and have meaning, then what does sex between two people mean? What, what does that convey? See, sex means something. Physical touch means something. And there's a lot of pain and suffering even in this room that has resulted from immoral sexual behavior because it's not just a physical thing. There's a lot more to it. And Jesus says, when there is sexual immorality in your marriage, that's grounds for divorce. Now, I wanna make something clear. It says grounds for divorce. It doesn't say it's an expectation of divorce. And I've seen couples that have gone through this pain in their marriage, and they have come through this stronger than ever. And I want you to know that there is always hope in the name of Jesus for restoration in your marriage by the power of God. And you might be here today and you're wondering, but how do I know if this conduct going on in my marriage is inappropriate and it's grounds for divorce? Or you might be wondering, 
What if there's abuse going on in, in my marriage? What if I'm not safe? And I want you to hear me on this, whether you're in this room or you're watching online today, I want you to know that you should not have to endure abuse for a moment. God does not want you to be a punching bag in your marriage. That is not okay. And I'm not gonna stand here today as your pastor and, and say spiritual blanket statements, okay? I'm telling you, if you are in that situation, please come and talk to me. Please come talk to Pastor Manny or if you feel more comfortable with a female counselor here in church, I will get that set up for you. We will make ourselves available to you. We will listen to you. We will love you. We will pray with you. If you are a victim of abuse or abandonment in your marriage, if you feel trapped in your relationship or you are unsafe or there's pain or there's brokenness, I want you to know you can come and talk to us because we as a church, we love you, we care for you, and we are here to support you and your family. And maybe you're here today and you're struggling with sexual immorality. And maybe pornography has the vice grip around your neck and you can't seem to break free. I'm gonna send you, if, you're, if you've signed up for our weekly email, I'm gonna spam you on that email with resources that's gonna help you. I put a couple in your sermon notes and in the bulletin today, you can check it out. But if you feel defeated by sin, I wanna encourage you that you have to change the way that you fight. You have to get more aggressive but it means that you're gonna to have to get more vulnerable. And I'm gonna give you a quick example as we close today. If you've ever been crabbing before, if you've ever just seen crabs in a bucket, they work really hard to get out. They don't like being in buckets, right? The crabs will continually try to get themselves out by crawling on top of each other, and then the, the, the one on the bottom will reach for the one on the top and pull it down and then climb over it. And it's this endless cycle as each crab is just trying to find ways to get themselves out, and they fight with all the other crabs. And the only thing they want is to get out of the bucket but it's the same futile attempts over and over and it's just nothing but failure. And when it comes to the issues today, some of you might feel like you're a crab in that bucket and you're surrounded by temptation and you feel trapped and defeated and alone. Even if you're surrounded by people, you feel alone and you're doing the same thing over and over and over and you expect some different results, but days turn into months and even years and you're still struggling. My encouragement to you today is don't be a lonely crab. It is time to come out of your shell. I'm sorry, Kay's gonna yell at me for that later. She does not like puns. What I'm saying is talk to someone, seek accountability. James says in James 5.16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other and you will be healed. And what that means is that there is healing when there is a healthy community, but you have to risk your vulnerability. And if that's the real cost of what it means to break free from sin, I'm gonna tell you, it's worth it. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are in a room full of broken people, myself included, but you are in the business of restoration. You are a God of hope and healing and we trust in you. Lord, we worship you and I wanna thank you